Well, welcome back to the Andrew Giuliani Show. Always happy to have you. Today, we're going to talk about broken windows policing. Uh, you think about it, it's been 30 years since a guy I know pretty well, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, was sworn into office, and he made the pledge to New Yorkers that public safety could be something that was attainable. Many people thought that New York at the time was the rotting apple, that it could not be done, that public safety was just something that politicians would promise every four years and would have no way to possibly deliver. So one of the things that I decided to do was to actually go back for the basis of many of Mayor Giuliani's crime-fighting policies and look at Kelling and Wilson's broken windows theory. Now, many of you have heard about broken windows. You may have even studied broken windows. You may have read articles about broken windows like I have recently. Um, but it had been a while since I actually went through and read the original article. And in order to make sure that we understand what broken windows is and how it's been, let's say, devolved by the left over the last couple of years, broken down by the left for their own political gain over the last couple of years, I really thought it was important that we start this year off 30 years to the anniversary of Mayor Giuliani's beginning of his tenure here in New York with one of the greatest turnarounds in the history of American cities, frankly, of actually a real breakdown of broken windows. Now, if you're following along with me, you may decide to Google broken windows. If you do Google broken, broken windows, what you'll probably end up seeing is a whole bunch of articles written by leftists about why broken windows won't work, doesn't work. I actually just decided to take a look this morning to see what it was on the first page. And a couple of them said, uh, quote, the problem with broken windows and researchers find little evidence for broken windows theory. Even the National Institute of Health, believe it or not, actually has an article talking about the social control and how that affects health. Um, so there's something from the National Institute of Health that I wasn't expecting to see here. Uh, but when you actually go back and you look at broken windows, we're going to do a deep breakdown into this. And we actually look at the, at the numbers. I want to start with the numbers because I think the numbers is a perfect example. You've probably heard me talk about this live on air on WABC because these are numbers that I've memorized. But the truth about broken windows policing is that it works and the data of broken windows and policing quality of life criminality shows that it works. We can talk about ultimately how you want to enact that as a police force from a political standpoint, what the political ideologies behind it may be, and also what some of the consequences could potentially be, both good and bad. I think overwhelmingly good. But in order to come to conclusions about this and opinions about this, we really should base, base it off the numbers, and the numbers are fact. Um, I've heard a lot of people, including Black Lives Matter, call for an end of broken windows policing, and certainly over the last 10 years in New York City, between eight years of Bill de Blasio and the first couple years of Eric Adams, we've seen broken windows being phased out. It's no wonder that we're starting to see crime, and especially quality of life crime, go up. Let's take violent crime, for example, in the late 80s and early 90s in New York, and let's compare it to when broken windows policing was started under the Giuliani administration and continued under the Bloomberg administrations. So if you go back and look at the most violent years in the history of New York City, you can look at 1989, 1990, 91, 92, and 93. In those five years, every single year you had over 1,945 murders. I might get the numbers a little wrong here because I'm not looking up directly with you, but you can look them up with me. In 1989, there were 1,900 and 45 murders. By 1990, you had close to 2,200 murders. 1991, 2,100 murders. 1992, 2,000 murders. And in 1993, 1,995 murders. So five short of 2,000 murders. Those five years, the last year of Mayor Ed Koch and the first four years, the only four years 
of Mayor David Dinkins, all four of those years, all five of those years, were the five highest murder rate years in the history of New York City. Not as a five-year stretch, but if you look since, I believe, 1928, so close to 100 years, and you take the years individually, 89, 90, 91, 92, and 93 will be the five highest years in murder rate history in New York. Now, going fast forward to 1994, about 1,500 murders. 1995, 1,160 murders. 1996, 700 murders, 700 and about 50 murders or so. 97, 98, 99, those numbers end up going down to below 600 by the time you get to 1999, 2000, 2001, but consistently between 500 and 700. Then, fast forward 12 years, you see under the Bloomberg years when broken windows policing is continued, um, you end up seeing that the murder rate continues to go down and actually goes down to less than 400 under Bloomberg. Under the first two years of de Blasio, believe it or not, when he had the same police commissioner, Bratton, who continued broken windows policing, it actually went down for a couple more years, troughing at 289 murders, I believe, in 2015. Sadly, we've seen those murder rates spike up above 400. Uh, and when you see the quality of life crimes in New York, you can see that sadly we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, but as to not get too opinionated on this, I sure you have an idea of where my opinions ultimately lie in. Um, I want to actually go through this here, and then we can get back to the opinions if we want to. But I really want to base this in fact in terms of what we know. So I'm going to actually read through some of this article for you and some stuff that I've highlighted. You may see more of the top of my head than you would in a normal podcast over here, but I think it's important that we dig into this, especially considering where crime opinions have gotten, how much the leftist media has gotten involved in this, and sadly, how groups like BLM and some other corporate groups that have pushed them um, have basically taken policing and tried to distort what it actually can do. So without any further ado, let's start talking about James Q. Wilson and Kellings, I believe George Kellings, Broken Windows, uh, how the police and neighborhood safety, the importance of police and neighborhood safety in a city and a neighborhood. So they start off talking about how academic experts on policing doubted that foot patrol would have any impact on crime rates. They actually looked at a study in Newark specifically in the 1970s, uh, talked about the fear of being bothered by disorderly people and how that was one of the biggest fears that a lot of neighborhood residents feared, not just violent crime. Obviously, that's the top fear, but also uh, just what we're seeing on the New York City subways right now as well, which is the disorder. You're being confronted sometimes by people that are actively using drugs. I know that's happened to me multiple times. Uh, and you're starting to look at the New York City transit system as a place where disorder reigns and sadly law and order uh, is long forgotten. So what they end up talking about is how the social consequences, if someone violated these rules, then the regulars turned not only to the police officer that was on foot patrol, but they also ridiculed the violator. So there were social consequences for said behavior. First, outside observers should not assume that they know how much of the anxiety now endemic in many big city neighborhoods stems from a fear of real crime and how much from a sense that the street is disorderly, right? We can take a look at this in their study in Newark in the 1970s, and we can now look at the New York City subway system. And you can see the real parallels right there. Disorder and crime are usually inextricably linked in a kind of de developmental sequence. Now, this is one of the parts that I think is one of the most important parts of the article, about four or five pages in, when they start talking about developmental sequence. So, obviously, a brief, a brief explanation of broken windows policing is simply that if you see that there is a broken window 
in on a street corner, for example, if that broken window is not repaired, then you are likely to see more broken windows because it is a signal that disorderly conduct ultimately reigns. Beyond that, what you'll start to see is more disorderly conduct, basically kind of a snowball effect. Whereas if there is a broken window on a street and it is fixed immediately, then you're less likely to see that devolving behavior. That's kind of the overall overarching theme, if you will, of broken windows. But the developmental sequence is a really big part of this, and it's a really big part of the effectiveness of New York City criminology in the 1990s, both when it failed in the late 80s into the early 1990s, in the end years of Koch into Dinkins' tenure, and also how it was effective, first implemented by Rudy Giuliani and then continued under the Bloomberg years. Developmental sequence, which is the disorder that is more likely to graduate to crime, right? Disorder is more likely to graduate to crime. If you see somebody who may be breaking windows, for example, if they get away with it, if there are no consequences, if there's no rehabilitation of said disorderly behavior, there's a very real chance, or I should say there's a much greater chance that that disorderly behavior ends up evolving into petty crime. Let's say petty theft, for example, goods of less than $100 of that. If then there is no intervention at that point when you end up having petty crime, then that crime can end up getting into bigger misdemeanors of crime. And then that crime can end up graduating into felonious behavior. If there's no consequences for people committing the actual crimes, then you end up seeing the developmental sequence, which ends up being a disaster, not just for those law-abiding citizens, not just for communities, but as a disaster for the human being and their family that may just be committing the disorderly act. The idea being that if you can stop somebody as they are committing a disorderly act, if they can learn a lesson, and if they can see that there is a better way to live their life rather than a life of disorder and potentially a life of crime, doesn't happen for everybody, obviously. This is just percentages. Um, but then you have a citizen, you have a neighborhood, you have a city that ends up, and then, and then if you want to expand it, you have a country or you have a state, you have a country that ends up being more law-abiding and less disorderly. So as we move on in all this, I want to read to you a little bit more because this is now focused a little bit into the devolving neighborhood that I had kind of discussed before. And I'm going to read uh, this paragraph in particular. A stable neighborhood of families who care for their homes, mind each other's children, and confidently frown on unwanted intruders can change in a few years or even a few months to an inhospitable and frightening jungle. A piece of property is abandoned, weeds grow up, a window is smashed, adults stop scolding rowdy children, the children, emboldened, become more rowdy, what we were talking about before. Families move out, unattached adults move in, teenagers gather in front of the corner store, the merchants ask them to move, they refuse, fights occur, litter accumulates, people start drinking in front of the grocery store. In time, an inebriate slumps, an, an inebriate slumps to the sidewalk and is allowed to sleep it off. Pedestrians are approached by panhandlers. At this point, it is not inevitable that serious crime will flourish or violent attacks on strangers will occur. But many residents think that crime, especially violent crime, is on the rise. And while it is not inevitable that violent crime will occur, it is more likely that it will occur in a place like this rather than in places where people are confident that they can regulate public behavior by informal controls. Informal controls that are not just the responsibility of the police or when best acted are not just the responsibility of the police, but of that of the neighborhood. If the neighborhood can see that there is disorder going on, if there is a broken window, if there is dirt, if there is 
uh, trash, let's say, for example, if there is graffiti, right? If that neighborhood, if that neighbor, if that group of people that ultimately looks at it and cares about the community can go and intervene, maybe clean up said trash or paint over the graffiti, then it's a signal to the rest of the neighborhood and to those that are committing the disorder. You have people here that care about the order of this neighborhood, that care about the way this neighborhood looks, and the care for not just order, but for law in said neighborhood. Subway graffiti, it's funny, they just end up going into this. I'm sure I was prepared, prepared for all this, seeing all this. So that's why we ended up going into subway graffiti before it was even talked about. But when it is uncontrolled and uncontrollable, the, cit the citizens may soon stop calling the police because they can't do anything. The process we call urban decay has occurred for centuries in every city. But what is happening today, it's funny, uh, I'm going to interrupt myself here. You can see this in today's cities, but this is 42 to 50 years ago as they are studying and then writing about broken windows. The process we call urban decay has occurred for centuries in every city, but what is happening today is different in at least two important respects. First, in the period before, say, World War II, City dwellers, because of money costs, transportation difficulties, familial and church connections, could rarely move away from neighborhood problems. When movement did occur, it tended to be along public transit routes. Now mobility has become exceptionally easy for all but the poorest or those who are blocked by racial prejudice, as they talk about here. Earlier crime waves had a kind of built-in self-correcting mechanism the determination of a neighborhood or community to reassert control over its turf. Areas in New York, Chicago, and Boston would experience crime and gang wars, and then normalcy would return as the families who had no alternative residences were possible, possibly reclaiming, were, uh, found it possible to reclaim their authority over the streets. So it's funny how they talk about flight 45 years ago and how easy it is for residents to flight then. We're seeing that in New York, right? We've seen that from Chicago, Illinois. We've seen that in Los Angeles and San Francisco. You have residents that have already started to leave New York City because they are afraid of the increase in crime. Same thing in Chicago, same thing in Philadelphia, same thing in Los Angeles, same thing in San Francisco. They have the mobility, the opportunity, the ability to do that. Sadly, the ones that can't are the poorest, are the ones that don't have the, the ability, the financial ability to do that. And so you see, again, another snowball effect over here. And then the second thing, and this is important, I'll break this down a little bit after I say this. Second, the police in the earlier period assisted in that reassertion of authority by acting, sometimes violently, on behalf of the community. Young toughs were roughed up. People were arrested on suspicion or of vagrancy. And prostitutes and petty thieves were routed. Rights were something enjoyed by decent folks and perhaps also by serious professional criminals who avoid violence and a court could afford a lawyer. Now, I'm not endorsing that specifically. Uh, I don't think Kelling and Wilson are endorsing that. But I think it's important to, to first off, read exactly what they said. So that's a quoting them exactly. And we're not advocating for Ill illegal police behavior. Let me, again... Reassess this. We're only pointing out that there were consequences. Whether those consequences were just or not, that's something that receives further discussion. But consequences are important when you have law-breaking behavior. If there are no consequences, then you're going to continue to see law-breaking behavior. A lot of times, that law-breaking ends up graduating from petty crimes to serious crimes throughout the course of time. Now I want to talk about the link between order maintenance and crime prevention. This is very important, and this is kind of the basis for quality of life policing. That link is similar to the process whereby one broken window becomes many. The citizens who fear the ill-smelling drunk, the rowdy teenager, or the beggar is not merely expressing his distaste for unseemly behavior. He is also giving voice to a bit of folk wisdom that happens to be a correct generalization, namely 
that serious street crime flourishes in areas in which disorderly behavior goes unchecked. The unchecked panhandler is, in effect, the first broken window. Muggers and robbers, whether opportunistic or professional, believe they reduce their chances of being caught or even identified if they operate on streets where potential victims are already intimidated by prevailing conditions. If the neighborhood cannot keep a bothersome panhandler from annoying passerbys, the thief may reason it is even less likely to call the police to identify a potential mugger or to interfere if the mugging actually takes place. This is a signal to the thief that this is a neighborhood where they are more likely to get away with a potential crime. Not a neighborhood that is clean, not a neighborhood that is orderly, but the disorderly neighborhood. They are, it's a lot more obvious to criminals that they could get away with said behavior. Our experience is that most citizens like to talk to a police officer. This is in terms of how the police can actually be involved with regards to this and how important they actually need to be in this process in terms of them on the ground with our citizens. Remember, over the last 10 years, I say in neighborhoods, over the last 10 years, police have been pushed from being proactive not just in terms of arrests, but proactive in terms of gaining information to reactive, right? When we hear proactive policing, a lot of people like to assume, well, it's just in making arrests, it's being overzealous. Proactive policing is not being overzealous. It is making arrests when necessary, but it is also being more proactive with neighborhoods, being more in touch directly with citizens, actually talking to them, collecting more information, gaining more information. If you can be more proactive in the information flow, then you're more likely to actually stop crime before it may end up being committed, whether it's actually by stopping this snowball effect that we've talked to from disorder to crime, or whether it's by actually figuring out where crime could be potentially committed if it's gotten to that point. Such exchanges give them a sense of importance. These are citizens that like to talk to police officers, provide them with a basis for gossip, and allow them to explain to the authorities what's worrying them. The essence, and I'm skipping around a little bit here, so again, I urge anybody to go actually take the time and read through Broken Windows by Wilson and Kelling, but I wanted to highlight some of the most important points, and then I kind of come to a conclusion myself on this, and really give you kind of the essence of what this means. Very important on the 30-year anniversary uh, of New York being turned around from one of the most dangerous cities uh, in the world, the rotting apple, as Time Magazine called it, to one of the safest large cities in the world year after year after year. And sadly, what we're starting to see, which is this de-evolution again. I want to talk about, they actually get into this where they almost look like a little Nostradamus here in predicting kind of what this could look like. The essence of the police role in maintaining order is to reinforce the informal control mechanisms of the community itself. The community has to be the leader in all this. The police cannot, without committing extraordinary resources, provide a substitute for that informal control. On the other hand, to reinforce those natural forces, the police must accommodating, accommodate them. For centuries, the role of police as watchmen was judged primarily not in terms of of its compliance with appropriate procedures, but rather in terms of its att attaining a desired object. And that object is order. That's the object that those night watchmen, which is originally how we ended up getting our police, looked for our communities to, our communities looked for our night watchmen to maintain, which was the order of things. So as we move forward here, the question is then asked, how should a wise police chief deploy his forces. And that's really where Rudy Giuliani ended up answering that question because you saw then the proactive policing, as I said, from an information standpoint where they created CompStat, which was again based on data. It allowed the New York City Police Department to actually take their forces and move them into neighborhoods, into areas where they knew said crime was more likely to be committed. 
And that's where you get to proactive policing because it's not just reacting to a crime once it's happened, but it's actually putting police in positions where they know that from a percentage standpoint, it's more likely to be committed. What that also does is it deters said crime, right? So if a police officer said, if a criminal knows that a police officer is going to be in a particular area where they're about to commit a crime, they're going to look and say, well, we're not going to commit a crime there. And then if they go to another area and guess what, there's another police patrol, they're not going to commit a crime there. After a few times, sometimes that criminal will just give up and say, you know what, this is not worth it. So that's a lot of times what ends up happening with regards to that. And you end up finding that once they end up doing that after a time, some people end up saying, you know what, let me go look for another way, another source of income, maybe a legitimate source of income. Some don't, some move out, some still continue to commit crimes in the neighborhood, taking the risk assessment and saying, you know what, I'm going to take on more risk. But these are kind of the tr decision trees that said criminal might end up making when they're dealing with uh, a, I'm going to say increased police presence, but yeah, in, in those neighborhoods, an increased police presence. And I would say a uh, more organized police presence based on the data. Okay. But the forces, but the police forces of America are losing, not gaining members. Remember, this is back in 1982 what we're seeing right now as well. Some cities have suffered substantial cuts in the number of officers available for duty. That's true of New York City in the last five years. These cuts are not likely to be reversed in the near future. Right now, we're seeing recruiting down and we're seeing some of the largest classes in police history get to their retirement years. Therefore, each department must assign its existing officers with great care. Some neighborhoods are so demoralized and crime-ridden as to make foot patrols useless. The best the police can do with limited resources is respond to the enormous numbers of calls for service. Other neighborhoods are so stable and serene as to make foot patrol unnecessary. Now, we get to a very important park and exactly where I think New York City is right now in its cycle in 2024. The key is identifying neighborhoods at the tipping point. New York City is at that tipping point where the public order is deteriorating, but not un <laughs> where the public order is deteriorating, but not unreclaimable, where the streets are used frequently, but by apprehensive people where a window is likely to be broken at any time and must quickly be fixed if all are not to be shattered. That's exactly where New York City is right now. We're at a place where we have seen the deterioration start. It is not unre unreclaimable. It is very important in this moment in New York City's history. How feasible this is with this city council, I don't know. And frankly, with this mayor that is going through investigations and the controversy he's going in. I don't know if he has the political will to do this. He has talked about it. He has flirted at the fringes, but he has not attacked this hard on, which is the way that he needs to. If we don't look and figure out a way to police proactively now, then I fear that the next five years for New York will lead us back on the path of the late 80s and the early 90s. To allocate uh, patrol wisely, the department must look at the neighborhoods and decide from firsthand evidence where an additional officer will make the greatest difference in promoting a sense of safety. That's what CompStat was all about. That's exactly what Rudy Giuliani did on a block-by-block -block basis. And you ended up setting up a chain of command where the police officer reported to detectives who reported to lieutenants who eventually reported to the chief of police and the police commissioner who reported to the mayor. So that way there was accountability for all of these neighborhoods and even street corners. So that way you could look and say, where are we going to deplore our limited resources? And it worked and it worked magnificently well. Let's conclude on what Kelling and Wilson say in Broken Windows. Above all, we must return to our long abandoned view that the police ought to protect communities as well as individuals, right? This is about just communities getting better. If communities like New York, if neighborhoods in New York end up getting better, then the individual ends up being protected as well. So 
Our crime statistics and victimization surveys measure individual losses, but they do not measure communal losses. Just as physicians now recognize the importance of fostering health rather than simply treating illness, so the police and the rest of us ought to recognize the importance of maintaining intact communities without broken windows. It's a community's job, and the police are an extremely important part of that community. And then you can see exactly why groups like a Black Lives Matter, other communist groups, end up attacking the police because you're attacking the social fabric of the community. If you're communist, then guess what? You don't necessarily believe in the order of things. You are looking for disorder because you realize that the only way to seep the failed ills of communism on a group of people, on a nation, is through chaos. A safe nation, a happy country, one that is prosperous, one that is thriving, one with leadership that has pride in their country, in their state, in their city, in their neighborhood, in their block, in their windows, they will not succumb to communist ideals. That's why Black Lives Matter has called for an end of broken windows policing. It's why you continue to see radicals on the left who have been indoctrinated in many of our failing universities continue to push against quality of life policing, proactive policing. And it's why it's so important now to make sure we understand the success that has happened through it and the success that can happen again through it. Do I expect the New York City Council to have a change of heart because they've heard that Andrew Giuliani endorses broken windows policing? No, I don't, my friends. I know exactly where they stand on this. I know where their bread is buttered. And I know that they don't care about New Yorkers. They care only about buttering that bread more and more. But I do think it's important that we go through the facts one more time. New York, year after year, 2,000 murders a year from 1989 to 1993. The end of Koch and Dinkins were some of the most disastrous years, not just in New York history, but in the history of American cities. You have revisionists, even people like Andrew Cuomo, who say, well, David Dinkins ended up increasing the police force by 1992 and 1993. Ask our own Judge Richard Weinberg that that was done through a push in the city council against what, Dick, what Dinkins ended up wanting to do here. There's a reason why he's a failed mayor, and there's a reason why the left is trying to rehabilitate his image, because they don't want broken windows to be the answer. It is the answer. It's through the data. It's not just through somebody who may have some biased views like myself, because I kind of like the guy, Rudy Giuliani, who enacted this stuff. Murders, 2,000 a year, five short years later, down to less than 700. Ten years after that, down to less than 400, even a couple years after that, down to less than 300. That's right. In 20 years, murders went down from 2,000 a year consistently to less than 300. It can happen again. But again, as Wilson and Kelling talked about, you need to make sure that it happens now because if it gets too far, if it devolves too much, then it's going to take so much more to rehabilitate New York than it would at this point right now. So thank you very much for joining me again on the Andrew Giuliani Show, and I will see you next week.